And today we're going to talk about the helmet of salvation, and then we'll wrap up next week with the sword of the Spirit. Um, and it might, they might overlap a little bit because they're actually both in the same verse, um, but we're going to pull different things out this week versus next week. So if we're ready to jump in, uh, I'm going to read uh, not the entire passage, but I do want to jump back and read the first few verses and then we'll skip ahead. Just wanted to remind us a final word. This is Ephesians 6, 10. Uh, if you're following along on your Bible app, um, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. In verse 12, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. 13, therefore, remember, in other words, in light of all of this, this is what you can do. Put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you'll still be standing firm. Now let's jump ahead to our verse for today. 17, put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So as you remember, we started uh, a few weeks ago by looking at the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and then Ben talked to us about the shoes of peace, the gospel of peace. And then uh, Dale did a great job last week talking to us about that shield of faith. I love how he talked about um, that the shield is not purely uh, defense. You know, it's not just like cowering back and hiding behind something, but it's actually used in battle to, to press forward. And as the scripture tells us, to extinguish those fiery arrows that the enemy throws at us. And so we're going to move on today um, because as it tells us there, you know, we, it's like we need all of these things. I like to think of it as, as tools in our tool belt to be fully prepared and to accomplish the things. We need like all of these things. And today we're going to focus on the helmet of salvation, as it were. Um, just before uh, we start exploring, let's just pray and invite the Holy Spirit to come. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for every person gathered here. I thank you for those joining us online. We thank you for your word, and we ask now, Holy Spirit, that you would come and illuminate your words, that you would bring your anointing um, so that I could simply be used as a conduit for you to get in touch with your people, to encounter us today, Father, even for myself. I ask, would you come and do something new? Would you bring us to life with your word in Jesus' name? Amen. All right, so uh, as you know, I like to do, I kind of like to work into things backwards sometimes. So we're going to kind of get to where we're going, but maybe not in the most straightforward path. I think we need to step back and, and define some things and look at some things to understand uh, to us, what is the purpose of these different tools we've been exploring? What is the purpose of the helmet of salvation? Um, and again, we can, we can sort of take it at face value. You know, well, you know, uh, in, in the time of battle when, uh, you know, pre-modern uh, warfare, a helmet would have been used, you know, to, to keep, like, you're, you're a, a ground troop, and, you know, someone comes by in the cavalry, you know, they're not, they're not going to be able to get you there with your sword, where your shield might not help you. Uh, it was just a different mechanism. But it is obvious, uh, if you want to think about it this way, that, that part of what the helmet does is to protect you from a variety of things, to protect your, your head, your brain, uh, a pretty important part of your body, um, but it's not necessarily always for like direct attack. You know, somebody's trying to, when you're on the battlefield, all different kinds of things can happen, right? Like uh, there can be shrapnel, you know, flying across the battle. And so there, there's, there's multiple purposes for, for a helmet. And what we're going to look at today is first we're going to explore um, and, and help maybe change your frame of mind about the word salvation, because how, how does that become a helmet? And then we're going to look at, at what, is it, what is it protecting? What is, the, what is the purpose of it? 
But let's step back first and look, if you are familiar at all, you've probably heard the word sozo when we, uh, and, and let me just stop, I'll make this recommendation probably again next week. Um, but if you love to dig a little deeper uh, in your Bible study, I have a great recommendation. I know uh, there's a number of different tools out there, but I love to use the Blue Letter Bible. It, it's a Bible app. What's great about it, um, and I could have gotten fancy and, and had it up on the screen and actually showed you, but um, I'd be glad to show anybody afterwards. You, you can go in any particular passage and basically just long press on the verse, and it opens up a host of tools. And one of them is you can go and look at the, the Strong's definition of words. And, and, and you can look at, I mean, more things that I didn't have time to talk about. But this is where we get that. If you go into the original language, sozo is the word uh, that, that is rendered here as salvation. And if you look at the definition, I'm, I'm not sure what I'm rubbing against. Check, check. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. All right. Uh, hello again online. We were discussing what we should do to let you know if you hadn't figured out what was going on there. Uh, so anyway, um, now that we're, we're back, um, I probably should have gave him this too, but we'll figure that out after. All right. So Sozo. We were talking about Sozo. And um, I loved, and I edited this for conciseness. There's, there's a little more Uh, to it. But if you go and look at the Strong's definition of the word sozo, it has all of these different things. And it is to save. Um, I know we we think of that, you know, most basic part, like, well, salvation is to save. It is. And we are saved. And most of us understand what we're saved from. We have a basic understanding of the gospel. We're saved from the curse and penalty of sin. Uh, We're saved from eternal damnation. There's all these different things. But there's more to it than that. So sort of to expound out of that, to save, i.e., deliver, protect, heal, preserve, save, do well, be whole. Um, I have often heard it said uh, more concisely, saved, healed, and delivered. Um, but, but it includes all of these things. And the other thing that I, I like to uh, think about when we think about that, it, it's not simply what we're saved from. That, see, what we're saved from might have to do with the state of our soul in eternity, but it doesn't have anything to do so much with what happens to us here and now. How does it change our life? How, and so I like to say there is a, the truth of what we're saved from, but we're also saved to something. There is a new reality uh, in our new identity in the new covenant that we are saved to. And so I want to just explore that and kind of have this uh, definition in your mind as we go through the rest. Um, Again, I often think, if you're thinking more in the mode of of defense, you know, to, to be saved is just basically to escape the penalty, to escape the impact, to avoid that which might hurt, or that which is difficult or undesired. But it doesn't move you forward. You don't necessarily accomplish anything or get closer to the goal 
um, it, you know, if we use that, carry that sports analogy forward, um, you know, if if all the defense does is just try to try to, uh, sorry, I said that backwards. If all the offense does is try to not get hit and taken down, they can simply just keep moving back. You know, but but their goal is to actually move the ball forward. Now, there's there's a resistance. There's someone trying to stop that from happening. But their goal is not just to avoid pain. It's not just to, well, you know, I just I, as long as I don't get hit and taken down, I'm fine. I'm going to keep holding on. And we know. I mean, it sounds silly in that analogy. But how often do we as believers do the same thing? We think that... Uh, whether we verbalize it or not, our purpose here as believers on the earth is simply to preserve, to hold on until we get to the end of life and cross over into our eternal reward. And that is a piece of it. That is true. For those uh, that know and follow Jesus, there is an eternal hope. And we're going to talk a little bit about that idea of, of, of preserving because that's included here. But I want to expand and, and have us think about it in a broader context. I want to focus for now on that final part of be whole. Because we could spend probably a whole message on each one of these portions of the definition. But I want to focus for right now on this idea of be, being whole or being made whole. Uh, when we think about this idea of salvation both what we're saved from and what we're saved to, it is three things. It is wholeness in spirit. It is wholeness in soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And it's wholeness in body. Now, we, we know that we don't necessarily come into the complete fruition of that. It's, I, I don't mean to mislead you to say that when you become a, a believer, when you determine to follow Christ and surrender you to your life, uh, in an instant, all of those things are lined up. And as we talked about a few weeks ago, we have this very real war between the nature in us that has been renewed as a believer in Christ, that, that it's not that we still have two different people inside of us fighting back and forth, but we do still have this flesh that, that is still in touch with the ways of the world and, and the old person that we used to be. And so there's this tension, right? There's this war back and forth uh, between these different aspects. But, but what salvation means is to be whole in all three of these areas. To be whole in your spirit, to be made right with God, to be um, in alignment with what He says about you, who He says you are, to be whole and healthy and new to be whole in your soul. And this is, again, we're just going to kind of zoom in because we don't have time for, to, to explore everything. Um, but especially whole in your soul. And I think this is an area that's often um, not explored as much as it could or should be um, because, well, I, I don't know why because, but <laughs> I would like to explore it more. Wholeness in your soul has to do with your mind, your will, and your emotions. And I think sometimes when we think about uh, healing, for example, it, we, we most naturally connect that with, with physical healing. You've got a, a broken arm, you've got a, a headache, a migraine, some condition that prevents range of motion. We can easily connect that with healing. And we know that Christ's finished work at the cross paid the price to make those things possible. <coughs> But we don't often think as much about him coming and healing or bringing wholeness to our mind, to our will, and our emotions. This is what we're going to explore today, I think. When I think of the helmet of salvation, I think that it is a protection for our mind. It helps preserve us. It helps give us tools that we need. And really... When it comes to our mind, our mind is the place where our beliefs live. You know, the things that we believe about ourselves, and, and you all know, uh, you can believe something with gusto and passion 
and just simply believing it doesn't necessarily make it true. See, there's a difference between what is true and truth. Truth, as we talked about several weeks ago, is found and, and the perfect picture is given in the person of Jesus. He is the truth. And so, you know, it might be true that this chair in front of me will, will hold me up if I go and stand on it. That's a true statement, but that has nothing to do with, with truth. That doesn't tell me who I am, what I'm capable of, how God has wired me. And so there's this dichotomy between true uh, things and truth. And in our mind, we have those beliefs, right? The things that we believe about ourselves, the things that we believe about others, the things that we believe about how the world works. And I would suggest to you this morning that that is as much a part of salvation as what happens to us when we die and the healing that we hope for. It's about bringing wholeness to your mind, your will, your emotions, to, to bringing healing and health, if you can phrase it that way, to those areas. Right believing will do three things, in my opinion. If we get the truth, the things that Jesus says about us, and we align our beliefs and put our will in line with those things, right believing will protect, preserve, and provide. And we're going to explore those three briefly. But just as a, a physical helmet brings a level of protection from the variety of things that might be flying around a battlefield, salvation, or sozo, for our mind will bring protection because um, it will put a, a, a layer of truth between your beliefs and the lies of the enemy. In other words, lies are much easier to identify if you know the truth, right? And so right beliefs or right believing will provide a layer of protection because you'll be able to spot the lies of the enemy. You'll be able to say, even when someone with good intentions uh, tries to share something, you'll recognize whether that's truth or not, because you'll recognize whether it lines up with what you know God has said. So if we've been um, renewed, we're gonna, if you want to go ahead and flip, we're going to flip uh, to Romans here in a minute. Oh, that's way far. Uh, Romans 12, real familiar passage, one of my favorites, which I didn't mark. <laughs> Romans 12, just the first few verses. So, dear brothers and sisters, this is not on the screen, but if you want to make a note of it, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. So there he's talking about that wholeness in, in body. Because of all that he's done for you, let them be a living and holy sacrifice. See, we do worship the Lord by, by what we do with our physical bodies. The kind that he will find acceptable, this is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Uh, many translations will talk about by the renewal of the mind. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So this is what he's inviting us into. He's inviting us into, uh, as a part of our relationship with God, getting our mind right, getting our beliefs lined up with the truth of God's word, with the truth of what he says, so that we can distinguish truth from lies, so that we can be prepared um, well, I don't, I'm not, not going to jump ahead. Um, this will protect us from falling into certain schemes, certain traps. Um, just to dig in, dial in one more specific area as it relates to your identity and, and who you believe you are and how you relate to yourself. The truth that God says about you always supersedes and trumps how you feel about yourself. I can easily feel uh, any number of things. And I, I've talked to you about this before, 
But how easy is it to slip into self-condemnation, right? And this is that area where that dichotomy between true and truth, I might do something that's not smart and that has consequences. And it is true that I, that I made that choice or that I did whatever that thing might be. It, it, it's, I'm not advocating that you deny when you mess up that you did that thing. But where the pitfall is, is when you begin to identify as the kind of person. In other words, uh, I mess up. I can admit that I did that thing, but I should also, rather than beginning to self-condemn and even identify with that mistake or that feeling, I can actually run to my father and say, God, I thank you that I'm actually not a slave to that choice. That whatever that thing is, that that's not who you've made me to be. And see, this is where we recognize that truth is in there because you recognize even though you did that thing, even though you partnered with that or made the wrong choice, it actually helps you be reminded and recognize that's actually not who I'm made to be. I did that, yes, but I did it operating outside of the identity that God has created for me. This is where the enemy will come in. You know, he brings those accusations. You know, well, you know, you say that you're a believer, but would a believer really do that? Like, you don't really believe God deep down in your spirit, or you wouldn't have done that. And, and this is, I'm trying to, like, illuminate the trick for you. Because the fact of the matter is, if you're hearing those things, and some of you, like, you've heard me say this before. You know, the very fact that you hear those things and you feel that, that tug is proof that you are renewed. Like, if you were you're totally uh, as depraved as the enemy wants you to think, you wouldn't have any sense of guilt or remorse or conviction. You wouldn't be able to feel those things because, because you would actually would be in alignment with who the enemy says you are. But the very fact that you can feel those feelings and that, and that tug between those two things is, is proof positive that you actually do have a renewed spirit and, and you've simply operated outside of it. And, and we all do that. You know, again, like just don't, just don't, we can feel like we're the only one, right? Like, oh, all the other Christians, they have it together. I'm, I'm, I'm the one, you know, no. We can all do it, but we can't ever allow a mistake to become our identity. We can't allow the accuser to come in and because here's the truth. He actually has no power unless you put your belief in his lie. Unless you partner with what he says and accept it, it has no real power. And this is where truth protects us. The more firmly seated we are in the truth of our identity in Christ, that we are a new creation fully renewed, the more seated we are in that truth, the more protected we'll be from those lies that the enemy tries to throw at us. The next thing that right believing will do is it will preserve us. Now, we talked about this. This is probably a little easier for us to get. Um, and I just want to say, like, I'm not saying that there won't be hard times, that there won't be times that you do need to, to hold on until you get through. That, that's the reality for some of us at times. And, and right believing will help you because you'll understand. Uh, you first understood that, that it's not your identity. Then you also understand where God is taking you. And that sometimes difficult things, although he is not the author of death, disease, destruction, what have you, we sometimes find ourselves dealing with the effects of those things, and right believing will help you persevere and move through that moment or even that season and, and still have faith, still understand. Um, this is where it flips from our identity to having an understanding of who God is. That he does not uh, author those things. That at, at, at our, one of our favorite verses here at Vineyard is, is John 10.10. 10. It's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Uh, and so if you're experiencing things connected to those, well, that's the thief coming and trying to come against you. And right believing and understanding the reality of the fact that we live in two diff the tension between two different kingdoms, 
will help you preserve through that and not succumb to those attacks that the enemy is trying to, to put against you. But like I said, sometimes we as believers can get hung up on that, on that preserving and think, well, that's just where we're going to live. I'm here to tell you, if you feel like that's all you've been doing is just holding on and waiting and trying to get to the other side of whatever it is, I understand that. That can be a reality. But the hope is that that's not where you're designed to live. You're not designed to stay there permanently. This is more the, you know, you can be in that place and, and think, I, I, I know I'm saved, meaning that, that someday when this life is over, I will be rescued. Well, friends, the hope of the gospel and the thing that we're trying to explore here today is that <coughs> hope doesn't always have to be deferred. There is a reality um, through the truth of God's word that you can uh, experience transformation today. Now, simply me declaring that statement, many of you are now thinking about the thing in your life that you're dealing with. That sounds great, Matthew but I'm still in the middle of it. My thing hasn't changed yet. My thing hasn't moved yet. It hasn't, and, and I understand that. I have my things. But again, we have to align our beliefs with the truth of what God's word says over and above our feelings. And so when you're in the midst of that thing, right believing will help you hold on if you understand that God is good. And that's not a conditional statement. That's not, God is good when things are feeling okay. That's not just, uh, God is good uh, when I'm not in hard times. Like, it, 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 there, there are no qualifiers. He, because it, it's actually the essence of who he is. It has nothing to do with uh, circumstances or, or anything. That is the essence of who he is. And as we understand that, and we understand that he's not the source of the things in our life that are related to the kingdom of darkness, we'll, we'll be able to better preserve with his help through those tough times. And then perhaps on top of both of those, the most important, oh goodness, nobody's hurt. It's, all, it's just the tally light. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the most important is that right believing, in addition to protecting us, helping us preserve through those tough times, it also provides us all the tools we need to move towards the victory that God has for us. Again, that is like both and. It is referring to the ultimate victory that someday, uh, be it at the end of your life, or when Christ comes again and, and breaks through the sky and, and brings the culmination of all things to an end, it, it is referring to that. But it's also referring to providing the tools you need to move closer to victory today in your daily life, to see more things come into alignment with God's truth. And right believing will do that. It will put more tools in your tool belt to be able to be a conqueror, to be able to be the kind of person that th sees things shift. Now, don't, don't take that. I'm, I'm hearing myself say that, and you know, the Lord is with me, like, remind them that doesn't mean that if you, you're not experiencing those things, you're the wrong kind of person. Don't let the enemy slip in there and add that condemnation either. But we're all learning, and we're all growing, and, and it's not, it, it, listen, it doesn't mean that y you are not to blame for the things that are coming against you right? The same that we recognize that God is not the author of death, disease, and destruction, you aren't either. Even, uh, think about that. This, this stretched my mind when the Lord started talking to me about this, when we were talking about self-condemnation. Even when you are responsible for the choice that landed you in that situation, you made that choice be, often because of deception, not because you were operating fully aligned with the new nature that's inside of you, tuned into the voice of God, led by the Holy Spirit. No, because we all still have cracks. 
We all still have sometimes wrong motives, and we make choices because, again, the wiles of the devil. Like, he is sneaky, he is deceptive, and, and when we make those choices, uh, let, me, let me back up and, and talk about this a different way. Every response that you have to anything that happens in life, from the most basic to, to the biggest, anything that you respond to in life, that response is based at its root either in fear or love. And, and, and I'd say we probably, we probably do both regularly, right? Because we're not, we're not yet fully perfected. But the Bible would tell us that there is no fear in love. Like these, are the, these things are like not, not compatible with each other. Um, doesn't mean that we can't operate in both. We, um, any life evidence would tell you that, that we do. But this is the journey. This is the process is, is more consistently moving from responses of fear to responses of love. The more we do that, and this is what these tools that we're exploring in, in the body armor of God will do, is they will help us more consistently respond in love. See, love doesn't judge. The person, if it is sometimes a person, that says the thing that trips us up, that we might blame for slipping and making that choice. Love doesn't keep that list of things that they've done in the past to where I can no longer choose to trust them. Uh, that. That's not the way that love responds. Love doesn't respond out of fear. It doesn't respond out of what's not present or focusing on what's wrong. I, I like to say it this way. When it comes to what we decide to believe, and I have this personal philosophy, but I, I want this to be true for us as a church too. I hope that when people think about us, they define us by what we're for far more than what we're against. And that's not the case, especially in our polarized culture for a lot of people. And I would just encourage you, there, there are absolute truths. There are things that are, that are wrong, that are not in alignment with God's truth. But it is a deception to be primarily defined by the things that you're against. It is not our job to correct the world. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. It's not our job to correct the world. Our job is very simple. Arise. Shine. In the darkness, wherever you may find yourself, shine the light. Because the truth of the matter is, Darkness doesn't yield to you uh, from behind the protection of a keyboard screen saying, hey, you're darkness. You shouldn't be like that. You shouldn't say that. You shouldn't do that. Here's 12 reasons why you're wrong. <laughs> nope. Darkness can't do anything but yield and disappear when light has come. Our job is to shine. And our job is to multiply. See, if you think of us as each, as individual lights, that's, that's our job. This is the one way you could paraphrase the mission and ministry of Jesus that we're called to continue. Is that we're called to shine in dark places and we're called to get as many as we can that are living in those dark places to come into the light and to become a light like us so that that light multiplies and covers the whole face of the earth. Then there is no darkness. You can't, you can't curse the darkness. You can simply bring the light. And so I know this might seem like, oh, gosh, we've went over here way to the side. We're way off track. No, we're not. This is what salvation is about. Recognizing the truth, having the tools to be able to operate. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, there's always this tension, right? Like you can, it, it can sound like I'm, I'm ignorant of the difficulties that many of you, you face. I'm not. I face them too. 
But nothing that we face, experience, or feel is going to trump the truth. And so it's not, you know, if you come to me on Monday and, and you're just having a hard time, I have no problem with putting my arm around you and, and, and crying with you. And say, yeah, that's, that's really hard. That's really difficult. But at the same time, while I want to empathize and, and I want to bring comfort, our job is to bring the light to that situation, whatever that looks like, to bring the light, to bring hope. And, and this is, <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to think how to, how to phrase this. You know, there are a lot of people that, that want to say these days that the church is losing its relevance. And you know, honestly, in some ways, that's probably true. At least in America. You know, I'm not, I'm not as familiar outside of the country. But you know what's not lost its relevance? The real truth. Where the church has sometimes gotten off track and, and gotten its focus misplaced, the truth of the gospel, the truth of who Jesus is, and the hope that that brings when you encounter it has never lost its relevance. What happened is the church has just maybe gotten its priorities out of order. Maybe we've lost our first love. Maybe we've started thinking that the purpose of the church is to host a gathering rather than to bring transformation into the hearts of men and women all over the face of the earth. And I've told you before, it's not that what we're doing here this morning is not important. It is. That we're, we're told not to forsake the assembling together, but it's not our purpose. The church is not an event. It's a movement. And my job, as daunting as it can be, is to equip all of you to go do it. And that, that's, that's not like a free pass, like I sit up on a chair and watch you. I'm, I'm actually included with the you. But my job is to equip you, the saints, to do the work of ministry. Because there is work to be done, friends. You know, we talk all the time about how we want to impact our community. And we do. Like that, I mean, I, I get to speak for myself. That, that, that's my heart cry. And that extends far beyond the, the practical things that we do. Those are super important. We don't, we don't want people in our community to be hungry or homeless or naked or, or lonely. Like we, we don't want that. We actually believe we can see measurable change in those things. But we're not just a social justice movement. We're not just meeting practical needs and it ends there. We're meeting practical needs and then we're, we're, we're hoping and we're praying for open doors to bring the hope and the light of the gospel into the hearts of men and women so that they can understand the source of the evil that they've experienced and that there is hope. That whether or not your your circumstances change in the moment, you can preserve, you can continue, that this life is worth living because there's more to it than what you've experienced. And we as believers, and, and I, again, like, don't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not pointing at you with five fingers point, like, I'm with you. We as believers sometimes don't live like that's actually true. And I'm not talking about moral codes and behaviors. I'm talking about like actually being, being alive to the point that, uh, that people ask, what's, what's, well, sometimes they ask, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and you know, I, 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 sometimes that's a good question. But it's like, but what, what's different about you? Why do you not despair? Because, you know, I, I've told you before, you, you can be a believer, does not make you immune to life's hardships. But the world will notice when believers in Jesus Christ act different when they walk through the same things that everybody else walks through. They don't notice when we pretend like bad things don't happen to us and we've got it all together and, and everything is sunshine and rainbows. They don't notice that. It's easy to be fake. Anybody can be fake. We pretend like everything's all right when it's not. 
They also don't notice when we slip into just accepting it and following that path into despair and hopelessness because that's what they do because they have no other choice. They notice when they see those things come against us and it doesn't break us. It doesn't cause us to go down that road. And, and, and honestly, even when that thing doesn't change quickly, people who operate in hope just look different. I may have told you about this before, and I'm going to close with this um, and save the rest for next week. Um, we had a poster in the youth room at the church that I grew up in, and it was just like full of all these little, you know, like stick figure guys. And they're all like just black and white, all going the same way, and down towards the bottom, there was one little guy that was green, and he was going the other direction. And it just said, Be different. Now, we're not talking about just doing something strange just for the sake of doing it. But, but if you think of our culture like the current of a mighty river, it's like it's really easy to go with the flow. But we as believers are called to be different. And that, and that doesn't mean jumping from one extreme of the political sphere to the other side. No, it means like oftentimes there's a third way. There's a kingdom way. There's a way to be different. And sometimes it's going to alienate people from you. Sometimes it's going to make you not be popular. You know, I just, I just have to make sure and, and like full disclosure, like this is, not, this is not your guide to popularity and promotion and, and whatever. But if we want to be the kind of people that Jesus says we are, we're going to have to be different. We're going to have to have that courage that we've been talking about, to be willing to go where the Spirit is going, whether it looks right, whether it makes sense to, to us. It's in alignment with His Word. It's led by His Spirit. That's, that's, that's the only place I want to go. It's the only place I think that you want to go as a church. Well, I, I don't, I, I mean, I, and again, I'm like, I'm speaking on your behalf, but my sense as I have conversations with all of you and we do all these different things, you know, my, my sense is that we're not interested um, in just like arranging things so that we can be like the cool popular church. You know, I mean, some of you are thinking, yeah, we're, we're a long ways from that, so that'd be kind of hard. <laughs> But I'm, I'm, not, I'm not interested in, in positioning us so that we look good in the eyes of man if we're not doing the work that Jesus has assigned to us. He can decide what level of, of favor or notoriety we have. But what I'm concerned with is, are we doing what he's doing? Are we doing the work that he's assigned us to do? Are we bringing hope and... and to phrase it a different way, are we increasing our sending capacity? I, I, we'll leave it up to Jesus when we need to increase our seating capacity, but are we increasing our sending capacity? Are we setting more people free? I hope so. I think that's in our hearts, but we've got to get trained up, we've got to be smart, and we've got to do the work.